Hello, what's going on? Welcome back to the Action English Show, episode number 116 with me, your host, Agostino. What's up? What's really going on? What's the word in town? How are you feeling? How are you looking? Are your hands where they should be? Are your eyes in your head? And are your ears attached to the side of your skulls? Great. Good to know. And in case you're wondering, I'm doing amazing. Amazing. Absolutely great. Apart from this morning, actually. And if you want to ask or you're wondering why I'm feeling a little bit, <laughs> but still amazing, because I didn't run this morning, man. I didn't fuck run. And as um, some of you might be aware from yesterday's episode or 115, the previous episode of today, because today's 116, so if today's 116 and the episode previously was 115, then that means the one before 116 was 115, you would have heard that um, unfortunately last, uh, well, yesterday morning, as I was running uh, through the streets of Playerstow slash Stratford, my eyes got distracted by a young lady on her way to go to school who was probably age 11 for some respects or some respects, right? D don't get me wrong. It's not going to that weird alleyway to relax. But I was running and you know sometimes when you run and you just lock eyes with somebody and it doesn't make any sense why you're looking at them and you just gaze at them for a minute. Well, unfortunately, I was doing that whilst I was running, I don't know, 747 minutes and 40 second mile right average pace so i was running quite fast and i didn't look where i was running and this huge slab of concrete stubbed my toe I ended up stacking nearly fell over but I put my hand out because i'm a boy not a girl i don't just surrender myself to gravity so i put my hand out in order to stabilize myself and in stabilizing myself i pulled the inner muscle on my thigh somewhere so not only have i got a swollen big toe right right at the little joint that links the toe to the actual um foot itself right it's right there it's sprained and not only is it sprained there but i've also got a sprain it near the, my, the right hand side of my nut sack like how annoying right and all because of a young lady going to school when she saw me fall over she was like <gasps> oh do you know what I mean she she got she got out of the she got out of the way i don't blame her do you know what i mean because if i would have fell on top of her she would have died th th that's for sure she would have died and then if all this mass um you know this ebony mass i'm sure she would have died she would let out a little whimper like but then, you know, slowly but surely died. You know, like in those in those movies when um, uh, the assailant or the bad person comes or the bad person's gang comes and attacks them in their own home and then they send a dog out as a first line of defense and all he hears, <coughs> and you walk into a room and the dog's been slain. You know what I mean? Um, sort of like John, not, not John Wick style because they, they kind of did that to leave him a message. But I mean, when they come into your house and you're already sleeping and the, the dog goes out to kind of like be the first line of defense, like, I'm going to defend my owner. You're not going to get my owner. And then he just flipping murk it. That's what that what that's what that girl would have been if she would have not got out of the way. So um, big up that girl for getting out of the way. Your parents raised you very very correctly. When a when a strange man um, is running um, at seven minute forty minute a uh, seven minute and forty second mile pace and he's staring at you for ten seconds and then he decides to stack. Right. The only thing you can do is get out the fucking way because that tsunami when it hits the ground it's gonna hit you, baby. So yeah, um, unfortunately, you know, I'm injured slightly. So today wasn't a good time to run, but I'm, I did some mobility exercises today in the morning and I've got my toes nice and limber and loose. So hopefully I should be back um, ready to run by tomorrow, which is going to be Friday. So I should, it should be a one day break that should allow me to, you know, recuperate, to rest, to mend my toe. And hopefully I should be back on the road running because like an idiot, this guy hasn't been fasting as much as I was before. Because if you remember... Previously, I told you I've been using this app called Zero, right? It's an amazing app called Zero um, where you can track your intermittent fasting. So it's this app like this. I'm showing it to the camera. My phone's a bit cracked, so if you can't see it, please excuse. But that's what the app looks like, right? Um, I've been doing it for the past, you know, for Monday and Tuesday, but the last couple of days have been a bit all over the place, um, primarily because I haven't been disciplined to do it. And secondly, because I've been ingesting quite a lot of carbohydrates. And when I mean carbohydrates, I mean bread. I don't know what happened to me in the last few days, but I think when I saw some good numbers on the scales, I got a bit excited and I started eating bread. Um, so now I've crept back up. So I was 214 at the last weigh-in that I did a couple of, a week ago, I think. Or maybe four days ago and now crept back up to 218 so it's mad how much bread can add um to your gains and i know already anyway my bread is my kryptonite bread is the thing that really really fucks me over like if i eat too many carbs 
I know straight away that I've eaten too many carbs. But if I don't eat carbs, the weight just kind of falls off me completely. And you can see a market difference. There's a big, I could tell people were complimenting me and saying that I was losing weight as soon as I got 214. So I can tell my kind of threshold where you can where it's obvious that i'm losing weight it's 215 i think it's obvious and then when it gets to 210 under it's, it's really 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 obvious you can tell that i'm losing weight because you know stuff starts to look a bit slimmer on me and because i'm a big dude um generally the mass on the sides of me starts to like shrinking a little bit so i have a little bit more of a v profile and with these fucking shoulders these superman shoulders it kind of accentuates it a little bit more so um for the next until the end of sober october basically until the 31st i'm going to commit to fasting 16 hours a day and cutting out carbs completely and i should be back where i should need to be this morning i had an amazing flipping breakfast right i had all the cholesterol um, I had all the fats, I had all the oil, right, in this kind of dish I had this morning. For those of you watching, you might be able to see this now if I can get this up on the screen, right? Um, I, I had that, right, this morning. So I had two, three eggs, uh, spring onions covered with spinach, a couple of sausages and some bacon, right? You can see that right there if you're looking at it on YouTube. If not, I'm just describing it. I just described to you what I was eating, so you shouldn't need the visuals. But yeah, um, I just had that this morning, so nice and light. I've got salad prepared for the next couple of days. I'm going to have some more for the weekend. I'm back on the wagon. No more messing around. No more fooling. Huh? We're going to get this done, baby boy. Fuck around with me, man. God damn it. I shouldn't be wearing what I'm wearing at the moment. I've got a woolly hat on and these Kirk Cobain glasses. But, you know, I think it's better than showing my eyes, right? Just, you know, put these glasses on for... For the sake of, you know, um, YouTube. <clears throat> anyway, that being said, it's 116 episode. Let's dive right on deep because so many things have happened these last couple of days that I need to um, catch up on, um, share my thoughts and opinions, and then we can move on to a fresh new slab of topics. If anyone else would record this podcast, have you, ever been in a, have you ever been in a position where you write down so many things that you want to talk about, but you never get around to talking about them because you spend 20 minutes talking about one thing? It happens to me all the time. I've got an, a massive list of things I want to speak about, but I never quite get around to it because I'm always blabbering on about things that don't really matter. Ah, uh, case in point right now. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, um, let's get right into the topics. Let's move on up, move on in. Let's get deep. Let's take off our trousers, right, and dive on deep, right? Here we go, here we go. So I'm sure some of you guys are aware, Pusha T had an interview with Joe Budden on the Joe Budden podcast. And let me tell you, it was illuminating. It was absolutely illuminating. What an amazing, amazing episode, right? So if you're not familiar with um, Monsieur Joe Budden, then you will know, or if you're not familiar, well, if you're familiar with Mr. John Budden, then you will know that Joe Budden is a former rapper, now retired, who kind of turned himself into an internet personality of some sorts, right? And he has this very popular podcast which is called the Joe Budden Podcast. Formerly it was called, I'll name this one later, which is a really great name for a podcast. But they dropped that, decided to go to the Joe Budden Podcast with him and his friends. Kind of in the same sort of vein as like the Howard Stern Show with, you know, Howard Stern's got, um, it's a Howard, so obviously a Howard Stern Show, but he's got his co-host that he kind of does the thing with. Um, similar to kind of a bit to Joe Rogan, where he's doing the beginning with Brian Redband. Um, but now he kind of does most of it with Jamie, but Jamie's not really the co-host, Red Band was more of a co-host, but in that sort of similar vein, so kind of having it under an umbrella, and obviously he's got other shows too that he's doing, State of the Culture, which is a panel discussion show in the same vein as um, Everyday Struggle, that's now on, I think on Revolt, but you can watch it on YouTube, um, what was, oh, he also has The Pull Up, which is a, a, a produced entirely by himself, that's also on YouTube, where he goes and sits one-on-one -on -one with um, various people within the industry, and talks them, you know, talks shop about their careers, about the state of industry, what it should be, um, there's great interviews there he did with Vince Staples, um, there's a really good one he did with um, T-Pain, so it, all, all in all, he's turning himself into a bit of a media or mogul empire. But what's really special about the Joe Budden podcast, uh, apart from all the other hip hop ones, because for the most part, you know, I, I consume quite, I probably consume, which is weird. I think as a British dude, maybe it's same, maybe it's, di maybe it's um, different or the same for an American person. But as a British person, I probably consume more hip hop media than I do actual music, right? Um, now, maybe it's, it's increased in the last few months or the last few years because I've been DJing quite a, often. So I have to um, get myself more acquainted with, you know, uh, various R&B and hip-hop tracks that are, you know, in the current zeitgeist. So I have to kind of be familiar with what's out there. 
but for the most part i consume more hip-hop media than i do um music but the real problem with hip-hop media is that it's super chatty it's super catty um there's loads of sensationalism there's loads of trying to there's still loads of engineered gotcha moments um it's all kind of really gossip led and there isn't really an emphasis or there isn't really an interest maybe there is an interest but there is an interest because joe Biden's proved it but it's not an emphasis on talking about the music or talking about uh, the process talking about the current state of the industry it's all really gossipy kind of um interviews and if you want a good example of it you need to check the breakfast club and hot 97 Hot 97 and breakfast Club have sort of changed their tack now but in some of their interviews from the past you, if you fast forwarded it to the to, if you fast forward the interviews to like the last 20 minutes or last 15 minutes you'd always hear Angela Yee saying okay so let's talk about the album right but then if you look to the beginning of the interview you'd see that they spent half an hour five minutes talking about all the nonsense talking about who the person was in relationship with talking about something like that hit the tabloid press or the tabloid media online talking about um other people who that other people's careers that has nothing to do with the artists themselves and in the last 15 minutes will, or 10 minutes will be dedicated to the album and much of it wouldn't even be of any use because they had a <clears throat> there was a kind of um how do to describe it? i think ibra has the same sort of personality but i think charlamagne sort of changed there was a kind of um gloating there was a kind of uh basking in the glory of and kind of dismissive nature that they would be like when the artists would be like oh have you heard the album they'd be like nah like they took pride in the fact that they didn't hear the album that they were only on that show because um i don't know their publicist has good connections or because they were doing someone a favor or just because they like the person but they don't like the music and that always kind of rubbed me up the wrong way i mean they're interviewing somebody or they're sitting sitting with somebody and they don't have any interest in finding out anything more about the person or doing some research beforehand and reading their material or listening to their music I guess maybe I'm kind of spoiled nowadays listening to podcasts watching you know or watching podcasts for the most part you 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 rarely get an author um a pub, a, a public intellectual um a controversial thought leader or whatever it may be you hardly get someone on anyone's platforms and the person that's interviewing them has no idea what they've done in the past that has no idea of their arguments has no idea of their positions on certain issues hasn't read up on their recent um essays or books or seen their appearances in other programs it's very rare that happens and sometimes they even mention it they even mention it like oh you should go and check out his other interview on this other podcast like it's i mean um they all sharing the love but and on those kind of online radio sort of like show things that they do, for the most part, they don't necessarily take an avid interest in the person they listen to. Sometimes it's a generational thing. You know, there's a clash there. Ebro has this kind of com common narrative going on that he's like the old man and he doesn't like the new stuff. And he's, hold and he's trying to set a standard and try and be a quasi gatekeeper. Like he's kind of self-appointing himself this thing. Charlemagne's also sort of like kind of kind of does that but more in a sort of humorous take so and you know and mb is kind of like the quintessential like i don't know anything i'm just like a radio dj sort of dude you have to convince me that you're good so they've all got their kind of angles that they kind of play off against but for the most part for the listener i think we kind of get short changed because it, it eventually you know our favorite artists go up there and for the most part they're just subjected to you know 20 or 30 minutes worth of gossip and bullshit but thankfully with podcasts that has all changed we have long form podcasts where people can come on and talk openly and freely about the things that they're going that's going on within their lives and you know what happens sometimes you can actually gain a new fan case in point chance the rapper on joe Budden podcast i was always a i was always a fan of his of his music but never really a fan of the person there was something that was quite annoying about him maybe he was too cheesy too corny but then he sits down with um joe Budden podcast he talks about his career he talks about how he sees himself in the current landscape um he talks about his um his philosophy when it comes to releasing music he talks about his um stance that he's still independent regardless of if he's partnered up with apple he talks about all these interesting and amazing things he has a very he has a he's he's very self-deprecating he can laugh at himself and all of a sudden you're like wow i'm a fan of this guy i like this dude i'm rooting for him not only am i a fan of his music i'm a fan of his actual personality and that can go both ways obviously you can hear someone talking you can be like okay i definitely don't like you as a person but i think podcasts allow that opportunity you don't get done by the smoke and mirrors because you know sitting down for an hour or two talking about things and not getting interviewed is a lot different than sitting down and having your prepared pr statements that you're going to deliver to various platforms and it's you know it's what i kind of wanted to see with kevin hart and tiffany haddish when all that stuff was going on um with um cat williams right i went to kind of see them sit down on the actual platform and hear kevin hart actually speak about you know things that 
because uh, he's he's very articulate person, but for the most part, this press run that he's been doing for a night school has been, you know, very rehearsed question, very re rehearsed answers to questions that he already knows are going to get thrown at him. But I think he'd I think he'd have a really good uh, point of view um, or a really good perspective when it comes to being somebody at the top of the mountain, right? But he's so far ahead of everyone else that it's kind of nauseating to the rest of the group that are behind him. I think so. That's why people like. You know, the re I don't know who the other guy is was that's dissing him that was on Breakfast Club, but that's why he's got so many people that are not that don't like him, right? He's so high up, he's so far ahead that it becomes nauseating. Like they can't they can't um come around to the idea of clapping because there's no point, right? He's not even gonna hear you, right? That's how far ahead he is. But I'd love to hear Kevin Hart's perspective on um just how hard it is not hard it is to sleep, but how hard it is to handle knowing that you're that much bigger than anyone else and that's the only reason why people hate you. Not because you're a bad dude, not because, um, I don't know, you've done something wrong to them or you're a snake or you don't pay people. It's just because you're just too far ahead and they just can't fathom why you're the one that got picked. Because, you know, it happens in all generations. It happens in all generations of entertainment. There's always, that, there's always a, a group of one or two people who get picked to be kind of like the quasi- um leaders of the a, a certain subgroup of artists or entertainers right and then from that from that kind of person you then go in to looking a bit deeper like so if, if kevin hart puts a comedy show on you'll go to the show because kevin hart's the one putting it on but then also you might you might end up you know finding your new favorite comedian once you go and watch that show so there is that that always happens right but sometimes when a person is so big it can get a bit annoying but i'd love to hear his perspective on it and how he handles that kind of pressure a podcast give you that opportunity so, um, going back to the whole point, Pusha T sat down with Joe Biden podcast um, off the back of uh, Drake going on the shop, which is um, a LeBron James podcast where he kind of sits down in a class in a, you know uh, in a real barber shop. I don't, I don't think it's a set, and he kind of you know talks shop with everyone that's in the 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 actual record um, the barber shop, and they kind of shoot the shit and talk about things that they don't normally talk about um, in the open, right? People in America are really. I'm hung up or I'm really amazed by the whole thing because I guess LeBron James is swearing because I guess he doesn't swear in his day-to-day -day NBA life. I don't know. I don't really follow basketball, but I'm assuming he has a kind of wholesome image when it comes to basketball and being a family man. So seeing LeBron James, if he's kind of, you know, relaxed around his homies, um, you know, sp homies, when you say that, ugh, I sound disgusting, around his friends, uh, it's nice to see. But I guess um, Pusha T felt compelled to sit down with Joe Budden because the narrative of the whole Joe Budden and I mean of the whole Drake and Pusha T um, conversation was changed again because Drake, um, you know, let kind of like um, put out his feelings and let it be known that he was hurt, that he thought Kanye West was the one that um, passed on the information that Drake had the child in quote, in quote unquote secret. But then, you know, which then led to people sympathizing with Drake and feeling like Pusha T was being a bully and how could he expose a thing? And Drake was just trying to handle the situation as best as he could. And Kanye is a snake because he was he should have gave lift yourself to Drake. But then he ended up doing all that scoopity whoop stuff and then sending Drake a text before he released it. So loads of really gossipy um, Sunset Beach sort of storylines. But what's really, really interesting was seeing just how forthright and open Pusha T was um, when it came to sitting down with Joe Budden and how amazing it was to get two in two of those kind of interviews. One was obviously heavily edited, heavily edited, heavily produced in the LeBron James interview. Um, it was quite short because I think Drake mentioned in the beginning that he turns up a bit late because of traffic, so it wasn't as long as it could have been. But seeing both, um, both icon, seeing two such iconic figures in hip hop sit down with two of the, you know two of the most unconventional kind of media platforms known to man in some respects, right? A former rapper, a retired rapper, and a, a current global um, basketball superstar in LeBron James, both having platforms where they're able to share their thoughts on current society or the state of the industry. And it kind of garnered such response. It garnered so much, so much more views than your regular televised show on HBO and something. It's fucking insane. Obviously, LeBron James shows on HBO, but you know what I mean? It's like... I'm assuming they probably got more views um, running that show or the clip of that show that's on YouTube now with the, with the kind of half-pitched vocals than it would have done by people actually sitting down and watching it. It's fucking nuts, right? It's absolutely nuts to see. But again, the Pusha T interview was amazing in some respects, right? Um, again, not that bothered about the whole gossip nature of it, but I like to try and glean lessons from it that can be applied to us commoners. Because um, I always think, you know, as annoying or as nauseating as celebrity culture can be, 
I think the I think sometimes it is a reflection of what's going on in society. It's just an exaggerated version of it, right? When it comes to adultery, when it comes to backstabbing, when it comes to greed, when it comes to drug abuse, there's certain things that exist in celebrity culture that are a direct mirror to what's going on in society. So we can kind of glean quite a lot of lessons from it, right? So a few things I kind of picked out um, from the whole issue that kind of stung out. Obviously, the main point being that Pusha T revealed um, breaking news that Forty was the person that told um, that inadvertently told Pusha T about Drake's secret child. So the story goes that you know Forty was um, with or sleeping with a young lady who happened um, to be known as a fot, as they say in the industry. Um, and he was kind of uh, pillow talking with this woman. He felt very close to her. He was speaking to her five hours a day or, you know, whatever, however, a prolonged period of the day each day. And he revealed some intimate secrets um, regarding Drake and also his, um, which is something that's kind of flown under the radar. He also revealed his, um, um, his frustration with working with Drake, that there's a kind of, there's a conflict. Again, I, I assume they exist anyway. I assume most artists and producers have regular conflict right i assume if you have a business with a mate you're gonna fall out a couple of times but you know because you're mates you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna forgive each other but i would assume maybe being an artist and producer there is going to be conflict but it's interesting to hear that supposedly 40 kind of feels like he's been overlooked or some things doesn't feel it gets recognition that he deserves or some things there's a very there's a weird thing going on there brewing in the background but again maybe it's just like you know maybe it's nothing to really um um look at too closely because you know they're just two they're two people working together for a prolonged period of time you know over a long duration of time there's gonna there's bound to be some sort of conflicts happen there but obviously the most hurtful thing if you're drake is that he revealed intimate secrets about drake to the woman himself so which goes to them to say you know a lot when i when i read books such as murder machine that kind of you know um details the rise of the gambino family and all their hitmen and when i read or when i watch documentaries about the sicilian gangs or the nepalese gangs when you watch stuff like gomorra and you look into stories on those and you read uh, books like zero 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 or gomorra the actual original book by roberto Savi savarino right and you just look at mo so most mob or crime-led dramas a lot of the stuff a lot of the issues that happen um with gangs and them going down and their downfall can tend to be centered around greed right and love for the most part most of them are the reasons why they go down right um greed you know they get too greedy they don't they want more they want more and then which then leads to conflict which then leads to murder which then leads to eventually getting caught up in things and love right um the inability of most mob or most criminal organizations or most criminal um you know mob leaders or lieutenants or generals to keep a steady and healthy household is insane if you read the books nearly not, not n m mostly all of them have relationships where it's dysfunctional where the kids are errant where the wife is absent where the wife is upset she doesn't want to have this life anymore she doesn't know what she bought herself into and the guy is just running around hitting you know laying pipe whenever it needs be there's always that thing that they can never keep their household intact. And for some reason, it always bleeds into the streets, which then allows them to get caught. There's, it always happens, right? And you hear a lot of MMA fighters say that sometimes whenever they're um, talking about a victory, they always, um, they always talk about their team. But most importantly, you hear them choke up or start to cry when they mention their family. And they'll say the importance of how important it was that their wife or that their partner or that their family, that their children stuck with them and allowed them to be this... Um, social or familiar or family-based pariah where you're never in a house you're going for long runs in the morning you're sleeping early at night you're never around you're never present you're eating on your own schedule you're training twice or three times a day that requires you to have your family or your household intact if your family or your household isn't on board isn't on game with it it shows in the fights performances in the ring when they're distracted when they're having to you know um when they have to convince their wife or their partner that they're not cheating, when they have to, you know, um, make sure that their kid who they've moved to three different schools within a year is not uh, feeling upset or doesn't feel like they're on their own. There's all these things happening in the household. It always affects them in the ring. So I assume the same thing happened with artists in general, right? So I guess if you're um, 
I guess if you're like a, a, a regular lay person, I think one thing that you'd have to glean from this is that you have to keep counsel. You have to be very careful who you tell your intimate secrets to, especially if you're a guy sleeping with a girl. Because, you know, sometimes, you know, when you're sleeping with somebody that's very attractive or outside of your league, for instance, and you feel like they you know they're connecting with you, they want to talk to you, they don't mind hanging around and shit. Especially, it's like, you know, those one night stands. So, you know, sometimes when you have a one night stand, you just run away. There are sometimes those one night stands that go on to be like three year stands, right? Where you don't mind just hanging around, you're never official, you like just chilling, um, shooting a breeze, uh, talking about stuff, joking around in the bed, do you know what I mean? You can sometimes get a bit too comfortable and feel like you can trust this person, but you can't really. And I think there is a bit of bro code involved there where you shouldn't under any circumstances. I know, because girls are different, right? Because I know this is bad to say, but. For instance, like with the brunette, I, there's certain things I won't tell her, right? Because I know she'll just tell her friends. If I don't want her friends to know, I won't tell her. Because I've done it a couple of times where I've said, hey, don't tell your friends this. I'm going to tell you this. And she'll even, inevitably tell them. She just can't. I don't, I, again, I'm going to say it's a girl thing. Like, don't judge me. But I just think it's a girl thing. She just can't keep the, the hot tea. Um, she can't keep it to herself she has to pour some other people d d a bit of tea as well but i think dudes are more than capable of keeping the hot tea to themselves we can do it we can go to we can go to our grades of tea in our hands right all stale and with those fucking weird um alkaline or you know those little uh, floaters all around the edges we can do that we can hold on to that for ages and put it back in the microwave and drink it again you know what i mean we're fucking savages but i think girls can't do it so what i you tend to do is that like i just tend not to tell people certain things if i don't want anyone else to know i'll just keep it to myself it's just one of the things i do now again it's bad it's wrong it, it, uh, you don't do not trust your, you don't trust your girlfriend la 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 whatever say what you want to say but that's the way i do things right and i think there is a side of this that is on the same way but there is a bit of bro code involved where regardless of what you want regardless of how much you trust or don't trust your partner i think bro code dictates that there's certain things about your friends they should never tell your missus never 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 it's something you just take keep sacred um between that kind of bro relationship i've done i've made a mistake uh, once or twice of telling another man something about another a friend of mine that i thought they knew and I've seen the effect, right, of somebody like, oh, my God, man, I can't believe you told that person. But I thought they knew, like, I generally thought the other person knew, but they didn't. And I saw how hurtful that was, right? Let alone telling a fucking girl, right, who's going to go and tell 17 million other people because they just can't keep it to themselves, unfortunately, right? If you if you want to keep a secret, the, the, the lesson learned is don't tell a girl. She's going to tell somebody, even if she's, oh, she's like a sister to me. No, she ain't. She's not a sister. You just haven't got around to fucking her yet. Let's be honest, right? Um... That's what happens. So effectively, don't tell don't tell people things, especially if to, to do your best friends. Keep it yourself. That's lesson number one. Um, the other thing that was probably hurtful, I guess, for push aside, because you know he reveals that um, forty was the one that told Drake about the whole secret baby drama thing, and then Pusha reveals his own betrayal in his own camp with his long term collaborator, some woman called Cap. I'm assuming she's called Cap, and it's not no Cap as in the no lying thing from Atlanta slang. I'm hoping I'm not sounding like an idiot here. But um, some woman, some lady called Cap is a long-time uh, um, collaborator of, of Pusha T. She supposedly works on all his albums with him in some capacity. Um, there's a, there was a tweet that Pusha T put out a while back when it was a whole the whole beef was brewing. Something about that, you know, 100,000 um, can't dig up any skeletons that I'm not afraid of coming out or something along those lines, right? And the whole insinuation was that someone in Drake's team or Drake himself personally was going around offering £100,000 to anyone who would want to... Um, to anyone who would um, offer up any information, right, um, regarding Pusha T, like some criminal, some damaging information that Push, I'm assuming Drake could use in the disc record or whatever it may be. And then it also reveals in the conversation that they were offering free flights or private jet flights to wherever they were from that location to, to the, you know, whatever. Like, it was just really scummy behavior. But what made it even worse with Pusha T was that the person who's mediating these um, conversations between, you know, um, ex-colleagues or ex-friends of Pusha T's was this long-time collaborator, put, um, Cap, whoever this person, this woman is. So she was the one that was going around because obviously she's the only person within his camp who has the access and who has who knows the, the camp intimately who'll be able to call up the right people to get information. But fortunately for Pusha T, even which he mentioned, which is really an interesting um, um, lesson to learn, which is he was lucky that um some of the people that were called up even though they were enemies of pusher and he's not necessarily cool with these people because of a code of honor because of a you know a street code whatever it may be 
they were still unwilling to give up any information. They, instead, they recorded the phone calls and sent them to Pusha T and let them and let him know, hey, by the way, I know we don't fuck with each other. I know I'm not cool with you. I know, you know, whatever, we had a falling out, but I just want to let you know, hey, um, this person has been saying this. Like, wow. So I guess that's lesson. Lesson learned is just be a stand-up dude. Be a stand-up dude or girl, man. I think having the trust of somebody as a friend is one of those sacred things. Again, I'm not somebody that's a good... I'm not probably the best person to listen to about these kind of things because I don't necessarily have that many friends, right? Kind of probably on one hand. But I think for those people who are overly obsessed with the whole friendship thing and want to post pictures of their friends all the time and are always taking pictures when they're hanging out with their friends, which I think is really weird, right? We know every time you've met with your friend because you have it on social media. Um, I think if... I think instead of posturing on the internet with your friends, I think what you should do is act like a real friend and really hold that friendship sacred. Really hold it sacred. Really decide that. You know how the same way how you can't choose your family? In some way, shape, or, in some shape or form, you can't really choose your friends either. You can't choose the fact that you have a friend who most people hate, but is your friend, so you can't ditch the person, right? Everyone's got that person that they know who is a fucking dick outside of them being your friend, but you just can't help not being their friend, right? And you know, you know, you, you know well and good why some people would hate your friend. You know it. You, there's, no, there's no denying it. There's no need to lie. You know exactly why people think your friends are dickhead, but you, you don't, and you love their friend. For that reason, right, sometimes you can't even choose your friends. So if that's the case, you have to go to bat with your friends. You have to go to the end. You have to ride or die with your friends. You can't be sitting there revealing intimate details about your friends to enemies or to people that want to do harm to them. You can't do that. You just have to be there for them, come rain or shine. And I guess that's what's most helpful, I guess, if you're a push of tea, that you're a long-term collaborator. was the one to suddenly turn your back and stab you. But, you know, if you read the story of the Bible or you read the story of Jesus Christ, then you know, you know, the person that stabbed him in the back was the person that sat on the table and he broke bread with. So... This, this this narrative is all this time, right? The person that's closest to you is the one that's going to betray you the most because they know the most intimate details about it. It's not going to be someone from far, far away. It's going to be the person right near you. So you have to be cautious of it. You have to be aware that it can be that thing, right? Um, but also, I guess, if you're the friend, if you're the cap lady, you have to hold up. You have to you have to do the pros and cons of it. You have to weigh up and say, Pusha T or whoever the person is has given me all these years of friendship, right? Even though this bag's amazing and even though Drake is on fire and even though this person is the one who is coming up now and is the trendier person, you have to ride or die with your friend, right? Because you can't buy back those years, right? You can't, That's where the whole childhood friend um, gloating or posturing comes about is legit, right? That's why people say, oh, he's my childhood friend. Why? Because people know childhood friends, childhood friend means you guys have been through been through shit you probably hated each other you probably had periods of, periods of time where you've not spoken right you probably had periods of time where you've hated each other where you fought where you physically fought where you said really hurtful things to each other right where you've kind of questioned your friendship but because the friendship is so deep it's so ingrained it's so blood deep it's so um i don't know it matters so much to you You've got over it, right? You've ride, you, you kind of like rid through the storms. You've kind of come out the other side. That's why people glow about those kind of things. So you can't then swap that kind of friendship and be a fair weather friend. You can't do that. And I've, I've kind of, I don't know, if, I don't think I've suffered from it, but I've been aware, I've been very cognitive, or I've been very aware of the lack of people who are around me um, um, f um, now, um, as opposed to let's say ten years ago, right? when I was socially on fire and around everywhere and on the strip and hanging around and getting fucked up and handing out fucking free drugs and shit. Do you know what I mean? I'm aware of um, the lack of uh, click I have around me, right? Most of it is for my own design, right? I have like um, purposely withdrawn myself from that whole scene and I don't hang around those kind of areas anymore. I don't give a shit about going to any of their events. I, um, I generally have withdrawn myself from them totally right so i have kind of um i have kind of um i have a lot to blame for the situation right not even blame i have a lot of responsibility to it too you know it's part, partly my fault but i'm very aware of the lack of people around me who are around me you know 10 or so years ago right <clears throat> which is fine people have to move on you have to find new friends whatever but i guess if you're still in that scene you're happy to be in there you have to be a ride or die friend, man. You can't be that person that turns around and suddenly wants to now become like the tell-all of other people's business. I don't think that's fair. Um, another thing we learned as well is that Kanye and Drake's relationship is not as solid as we thought it was, which I knew anyway. You know, I, I was aware of this whole situation because if you watch 
I think I don't know what interview it was, but I remember it was an interview where Drake was. I mean, Kanye was talking about how he was happy in his position in music now, and he doesn't. He's, he's glad that Drake is number one, and that it kind of takes the pressure off him, and he can kind of just become an artist and all that sort of stuff. And you know, just being very congratulatory of Drake, and sort of um, in essence passing the crown and saying, "Yeah, you're the number one dude now." And I never quite believed that someone with that level of ego, someone who's um, proved everyone wrong his entire career. Right. Someone who's been able to permeate through so many different um, disciplines and through so many different cultural timelines and through so many different scenes of so many different eras. I just thought it was impossible that he suddenly now was uh, stoic about everything and decided, you know what, I'm going to give um, Drake the room to do his thing. I just didn't buy it. I didn't believe it because I, he's Drake is on. I mean, Drake and Kanye are two of the biggest stars in the world who are also very aware, very cognitive of their power and their influence they know exactly how big they are it's very weird to say it but you know you sometimes you meet people and they don't necessarily give off the vibe that they know just how big of a deal they are well you can't say that for drake and kanye they know exactly how much of a big deal they are they know how important it's like do you know um do you remember that line that jay-z has where it's like um my presence is charity and how it rubbed people up the wrong way right but it was true right like jay-z's presence at your event is charity alone right like him showing up, him bringing attention uh, to whatever cause you're doing just by standing there, not saying a fucking word, right? Is a charity enough? Like, but it's brutal, but it's also an acknowledgement of just how big of a star he is, how big his fucking nutsacks hang from in between his legs, not Homer, right? He knows he's the fucking guy. And those two dudes are the same. So I find it really hard to believe that Kanye would suddenly then just decide, oh, no, I'm going to give the crowns up. So I didn't really believe the whole fake bromance thing they had going on drake kind of bowing to kanye's feet when he came out and performed with him i didn't really buy all of it and suddenly we we, we see it with push the t talking about the whole relationship saying he, they've always had this weird back and forth relationship where they make up and then they diss each other and they make up this each other make up this each other it was all flipping weird and gay but push the t effectively saying that kanye's his dude and he's gonna ride or die for his dude regardless but you also got to see why in the diss record especially duppy record that be freestyle while drake while drake did seem to take shots at pusher he directed most of his ire most of his venom most of his fun of um vitriol most of his aggression to kanye and now you can see why because they've got this constant back and forth where they're friends and not friends friends and not friends and i guess again i guess lesson learned there is that fake friendship thing it, it's just annoying it's something that's always really rubbed me up the wrong way um this whole kind of posture and pretending you guys are brothers and all that sort of shit i fucking hate it um stick with your friends that are actually your friends or people in the scene that you can kind of use in order to kind of get forward or you know progress yourself in life because if eventually it's all going to come crashing down and then who's going to be there for you no one uh push your teaser ride or die friend we know that um and it's also very going by the push the ride or die thing which i like glad pusher kind of talked about and something I've always said is very important for people to learn in life is that you can't you can't ask your friends to act the same way you would act in situations. You know, sometimes when you go out with friends and something happens, I don't know, someone drunk says something stupid and you've got that friend in a group that just flips from zero to a hundred and wants to fight that person to defend the honor of his friends, right? Some people do that and some people just like carry on walking. Some people just like, don't worry or bands with the person. Everyone's got their own reaction to things, right? But what you've what happens sometimes that when it's when it's a universal disrespect it sometimes feel you can sometimes get annoyed when you know that person and no one else gets angry right when it's something when something egregious happens that affects that is universe can universally be accepted as rude and not everyone takes it as rude it can sometimes be really annoying when you're the kind of you know the social justice warrior of your friendship group when no one else gets annoyed by it like fucking hell guys man come on man Look what he did. Like He spilled a drink all over our feet. This is fucking fucked up. Like, no, nah, don't worry, man. It's cool, man. Like, can get, that can get a bit frustrating. But I like what Pusha T said about, you know, not expecting everyone else to react the way that he reacts. But he's going to react the way he is going to react, right? He's going to go out there like an attack dog. And whoever says anything about anyone in his camp, he's going to go, you know, he's going to launch 17 barrels at you, which is amazing to kind of hear and be so passionate about it. And be so cold-hearted, I think, in an interview as well, he mentions he doesn't really care if fucking 40 he lives or dies as well, which is, you know, brutal but honest as well. I love that honesty of just like, look, man, we're not friends. We never will be. I just don't care for the guy, right? Which is interesting. Um, but I guess if you're a Kanye, right, 
and you're seeing all this stuff transpire. And I guess they kind of tried to push push on it, but he didn't really want to, you know, um, expound on it a lot a lot more than he probably should have. Was that it should be annoying if you're Pusha T and you're constantly attacking Drake in defense of your good um, good music colleagues. But then around your back or behind your back, uh, Drake and Pusha T and um, Drake and Kanye are organizing secret um, studio sessions where they don't want to invite you in case something pops off. Right. Because he mentions this certain times when he was in Wyoming um, what he fly the day before Drake would come in. They never let Drake and Pusha T be in the same studio together. So there's always that kind of tension that exists. Right. So um, it must be annoying if you're Pusha T and you're going to bat with your friends, you're willing to die for your friends. Right. And then. Um, you're seeing these guys too, you know, you're seeing them do this fake bromance and conspiring with each other. And I guess it's pretty hypocritical of Kanye to do that. I guess I think people do it in general because I was a little bit, not hypocritical, but I guess of his friends maybe. It, it, it kind of rubbed me up the wrong way when I saw pictures of, you know, Drake at his, uh, the New York block party he did, right? Remember during the whole Scorpion tour, they did that whole, they did a block party where Virgil was DJing. You see the picture of them doing the, you see them DJing, right? So Virgil, again, long-time Kanye collaborator, supposedly one of Kanye's friends. Again, I, I don't believe that either. Um, he then DJs at the event. And guess who turns up, right? This, this is all during the time when Kanye goes on to um, Chicago radio and says that he feels as if like all the stuff that happened at TMZ wouldn't happen if his friends from back in the day were around him, right? He's like, you know, he kind of goes, he kind of lends credence to the whole narrative that, you know, Kanye needs a, um, a real soul food. He needs a black woman beside him to slap the shit out of him when he says nonsense stuff, right? That whole narrative is stupid because since he's been back to Chicago, quote unquote, he's been even more crazy than he has usually, right? Um, which kind of, you know, whatever. Again, I, I, I don't know the intimate details of, of his group of friends and just because his group of friends doesn't happen to consist of people with a dark with a with a higher concentration of melanin in their skin color doesn't necessarily mean they're not giving him game or they're not giving him any worthwhile insights it's a preposterous point of view but what's really interesting was that he mentioned Don C by name and saying that you know Don C, if Don C was around it doesn't feel like the whole TMZ thing would happen but then you um you look at it and Don C is at the Drake block party event you know what I mean like in the booth with Virgil and it must be annoying, right? It must be weird if you're Drake and two of your, you know, your guys that you grew up with, the guys that were, you know, you know, instrumental in establishing good music for what it was. And, you know, they all use, they all use good music or the Yeezy brand as a launch pad in order to kind of get their own careers running up. We've just done, we've just done and Virgil with his Off-White collection and P Paris before that. They've all come, kind of come from the school of Kanye and, you know, They've kind of maybe abandoned him in some respects. Now we don't know what the inner goings on. They could have Kanye could have done something egregious to kind of fr uh, push these friends away in general, but there is something about it that kind of rubbed me up the wrong way. And if you think about the whole embrace that Virgil had with Kanye at the end of the runway show, you know, yes, some of that was you know um, an acceptance of how much struggle they've kind of gone through in the industry, interning at Fendi, um, giving them leather jogging pants and all that sort of stuff. It could be an acceptance of that, but it also could be an acceptance or an understanding that they probably haven't seen eye to eye in the last few years or so, right? Kanye's probably felt a bit away. I think he mentions it slightly in the interview with Charlemagne about the whole him getting a Louis Vuitton job. Like, it must irk him a little bit, you know, seeing Virg the success Virgil's kind of um, been able to orchestrate on his own path without having a Kanye association, you know? There's little things. That, but, and even press releases, if you read press releases of, of Virgil, in the beginning, there was a lot of mention of him being an ex-Donda or Kanye West collaborate, collaborator. But now, for the most part, they just mention, of course, he's done a lot to establish his own name. But there is a, I, I know how publicists work and having dealt with people within that team in my uh, previous roles, I know that they make a real, they, they're really, they really emphasize words. They want you to use a particular word in order to describe somebody, right? They want you to um, put certain things in a sentence in order for people to kind of, to, in order to frame the conversation to make the person look a certain way. So if Virgil's dropping the whole Vert Kanye um, ex creative director moniker, there's a reason why that's happening. Again, these are all things that are probably looking way too deep into it, but it's interesting just to kind of see the whole aspect, the whole kind of, to see the curtain being pulled back and some of the things that I kind of was already thinking of, you know, these guys are playing make pretend scene friends. I've seen it before again, being in the streetwear community, growing up in a sneakerhead, you know, growing up as a bit of a sneakerhead in the beginning, starting off, you know, interning or working for um, Hypebeast and doing online stuff for them when they first launched and being around the scene and working in 1948 and seeing just how people move. There's, 
I know, I know, I can see fake friends from a mile off. I know for a fact. But again, it's not my business. I don't care. That's nothing to do with me. But I know the posturing that goes on within the scene, right? I've seen someone like Aaron Bondaroff, who's, who's kind of instrumental in getting me in kind of uh, inspiring me to do the things that I'm doing now at the moment, right? In terms of trying to turn my lifestyle into a business, right? Um, or turn my lifestyle into a job, for lack of a better term, right? Instrumental, one of my kind of like greatest um, source of inspiration or motivation or someone that I look up to mentally, right? Someone who I still read old interviews of Aaron Bond or to this day. You know, um, unfortunately, he gets accused of um, sexual assault by two young ladies, I think so. Um, very heinous uh, uh, crimes against him, but... The collective like dropping of him in public was insane, right? No one is out there backing him. No one's out there being a friend. Now, I'm not saying what he did was right or wrong, right? I'm not saying that. Oh, I'm just saying if that's your friend, you ride or die with him. That's the that's what I said. I remember Joe Rogan saying the same thing. If his friend got accused of something really disgusting, he doesn't care. I'm still gonna be their friend, right? And I think people are like, oh my god, it's disgusting. No, but it's the truth. The real world doesn't work how um, the media likes to portray. Like, oh, if you have a friend that does something really crazy, you're gonna drop them. It doesn't really happen that way. You might be disappointed. You might want a bit of distance. You might not want to talk to them for a while, but they're still gonna be your friend in your heart, in your mind, whatever, they're still your friend, right? Um, you're still going to look out for them. You're still going to have an interest in finding out how they're doing. They're still going to be your friend. And it's, you know, the Aaron Bondra thing was a good example. They all dropped him like a hot potato. No one says anything about him. Recently, I saw uh, a tweet went out with um, um, one dude on Twitter who's like, you know, I don't know, I think he used to work at Hype Beast. Again, you know those people that are always fucking um, posturing on Twitter, like he's talking about, I don't know, just whatever, some dude, I'm not going to give him any, any shine, but he was, you know, um, chastising Lucian Smith because I think Lucian Smith, the artist who was formerly kind of underneath the Oh Wow tutelage, someone who's kind of come from the whole New York scene and he's an, an artist in his own regard. He's done some modeling for Supreme as well in the past. Um, he made a tweet um, or he made an Instagram post talking about Aaron Bondrov saying the mistakes, you know, talking about, you know, basically saying that he needs to make amends and be welcome back into the industry and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he got absolutely attacked, I think, in the comments so much so that he had to take the post down. And this guy on Twitter kind of retweeted it and was basically making comments. And it's just like, come on, man. Like, what the fuck is going on here? You know, all these people were the ones that were, you know, when they see him at events, they're the ones to lick his ass. And the moment he gets accused of something, they all drop him like a hot potato. Same thing happened with Asa Bari, right? Um, we don't necessarily know the extent of the crime. We saw the video that looked, you know, it looked quite bad. But luckily with Asa Bari, I think he was fortunate enough that he built enough of a um, uh, on the ground um, cult following that it didn't really impact his bottom line that much. He lost, I'm, sh I'm sure he lost a lot of brand deals, a lot of sponsorships and stuff. I'm sure publicly a lot of people have stepped away from him. But, you know, for the most part, um, he's been able to kind of ride through the stormy seas. But I wonder what Aaron Bondroff is doing, right? They dropped his name for the gallery. He's been, quote unquote, dropped by Supreme, I think. He doesn't really do anything with Supreme anymore. For, but for the most part, Supreme, you know, are focusing mainly on having young kids as their models. They don't really put older dudes in their clothes anymore. Um, but, you know, the, the, the gallery got renamed, right? It's not even Moran Bondroff. It's Moran Moran now. Um, he's not part of Oh Wow anymore. He's stepped away from that. Like, bloody hell, man. Imagine, like, his whole world came crashing down on him and no one seemingly in the scenes backing him now maybe in private there's he's got he has some patrons that are you know allowing him to exist and stuff but fucking hell dude fucking hell friendship eh, in the scene toxic as fuck man get some real friends outside the scene don't anyway yeah and lesson learned in the whole thing don't be a chatty patty if you're a dude man keep your counsel um don't tell girls your uh, your your friend's business and i don't know if you're gonna gossip gossip about stuff that has nothing to do with that has nothing to do with both of you guys right just there's so, there's so many things on in current pop culture now that you could gossip about instead of going talk about your friends. Anyway, but anyway, next topic. Uh, Terrell Lewis controversy. Now, this topic came out uh, on the back of the whole um, woman in, you know, that thing with a lady I mentioned the other day, right? Where um, she's blocking the dude from coming into a building um and the dude happens to be black she happens to be white so the optics of it are fucking awful um they have a back and forth she she wants him to show his keep up in order to ascertain that he lives there or not he refuses to do that refuses to give her, her his door number refuses to give her name they get into an argument eventually um he pushes his way into the building goes up to his floor she follows him 
um, he opens his door to his apartment and then suddenly the woman kind of realizes that she made a grave mistake and she starts to kind of apologize, but not really. Um, you knew what the story was going. You knew how that story was going to unfold. Um, it went out to the media. Um, or it went. It went viral. She got called some sort of name, apartment patty or something like that. And then you know, by and large, they found out who her employer is, and she got fired. So now she's got a job. But what's really interesting about that whole story was that we found out that supposedly she had a, her ex partner is black, right? So I guess it lends a question: like, can you go out with somebody? Can you be in a relationship with a minority or somebody from a particular racial background, color or creed, and still hold racist views against that particular group of people? I'm going to say yeah, right? Because I used to live in an area called Custom House Canning Town where there was a very strange... There's a really weird racial tension in that area, right, between black people and white people. Most of it to do with council housing, most of it to do with, you know, just to do with general just stupid... Um, prejudices right but there was a lot of um, anger and resentment was built up when a predominantly white family um, had a daughter or a, a female relative who got into a relationship with a black dude but then the black dude happened to be a scumbag and ran away right and didn't hold up his end of responsibilities right he wasn't present in their life he didn't pay child support which then um, reinforced or added weight to the said people's resentments, right? The family's resentment against that, in, against the entire uh, race of people. Now, again, it's ignorant to think like that, right? You can't just take your one anecdotal experience and then uh, apply that generally to a whole swath of people. But you can understand why someone who has a daughter who happens to fall in love with a dude that you don't approve of because he's 24, not because he's black and she's 18, right? But he's 24. And then she ended up getting pregnant with him for the first time having sex, which is already traumatic, I, I'd, I'd assume, right? Losing your virginity, and then you end up getting pregnant the first time. Happens a lot in the area that I was in, right? And then she ends up having the kid, and the guy decides to um, go AWOL, right? It can make you think some fucked up shit. And if you don't think like that, then you're not being honest with yourself, right? Um, so there's it, that creates a weird racial divide. Then in general, there was a very strange thing between Caribbeans and Africans in that area too because some of the Caribbeans came a bit earlier um, in the 70s or 60s and then um, that sometimes caused a lot of... Um, but there's a lot of tension there with the Africans and Caribbeans because some of the African communities were able to um, establish businesses in the community before the Caribbeans, who then saw the Jamaicans or the Caribbeans as being lazy, which brought loads of resentment. So then some of the black people in, in either side, on either side, some black people in the black in the African community and the Caribbean community, in an effort to um, in an effort to not cause any issues, try to assimilate by assimilating too much, right? So you've got the image of a black person in Canton or, or Custom House with a shaved head, right? Didn't want to have any sort of um, discerning features on their hair, like in terms of a fade, in terms of dreadlocks that showed they were black and had a, a very exaggerated Cockney accent, like, oh, all right, mate, all right, mate. And I'm sure if you're from the area, you'll know exactly the kind of black guy I'm talking about, right? Um, his name is Dean or Daryl or some fucking um basic name like that right and he got he goes out of his way way out of his way to not say he's black basically or to not act like he's black to have any sort of black sort of tendencies whatsoever right the only sort of black tendency he might have is that he's in a ska band or that he djs or whatever that's it right for the most part it's just purely like wearing ben sherman shirts tucked in with those harrington jackets and a bald head like and always and always with like some you know, a, a fairly Caucasian lady with uh, very cropped hair that's dyed and spiked up, right? There's a particular look about it. So it causes really weird racial tension. So sometimes when someone says, oh, you can't be racist if you go out with X, Y, Z person, I think you can because I think some of those dudes haven't spoken to them or haven't been in arguments or haven't been chased by some of those guys. They have a lot of resentment for their own community or for people of their own color or creed, right? Some of it has, you know, some of it in their, from, their, from their side of things is warranted, sometimes it's not. But that whole story was interesting. But what's even more interesting was a story that happened the other day with this guy called Terrell Lewis, who's, I don't really know that much about him, but having done a bit of research online, he happens to be like a, a personality of sorts on social media. Um, I'm assuming um, he was uh, someone related to gangs, um, went into prison early in life and then came out and kind of reformed himself. And underneath his kind of moniker of being fit and having a strong mind, body and soul, he's been able to kind of inspire a whole group of people all around the internet webs and in real life uh, to kind of take control of their lives, right? Because he's got his outdoor Jimmy thing he does in Brixton, I saw clips of. So in general, it seems like a really positive dude that's trying to make change within his community instead of com complaining about shit, right? So um, 
he's on a train somewhere outside of London and um, an argument ensues on a train where I think there's a boy sitting on a train and he has a free seat next to him. I think he has a bag on it. Let's say he has a, let's say he has a bag in this story. He has a bag or something on the seat. A woman wants to sit down. They get into an argument um, and they know to kind of like um, diffuse the argument. The black dude, um, Terrell, um, uh, who I'm mentioning now in this story, the kind of like, you know, quote unquote motivational speaker, um, he kind of comes from the other side of the train, decides to sit on the uh, on the kid's seat in order to kind of like diffuse the argument and say, look, I'm with him, don't worry, he's saving it for me, blah, blah, blah. And then it kind of erupts into a, another uh, another argument. So I'll play the video here so you guys can see it, but this is kind of the, the, the gist of what happened. And then we can kind of talk a little bit about the ensuing backlash that happened on the back of it. It's on World Star, so you know, you know it's real. Put this on here, show it there. Is it on there? Show, yep. Let's go here, play. Come on, play. Oh, come on, play. This computer, there you go. So the guy's got his bag there and then she decides to slap him because he sees him recording him on Snapchat, which is, you know, physical assault. Hey! So they had an argument, right? Um, she, the girl, the boy's got the, the bag on the chair. Um, the woman obviously is, I don't know, it starts off already contentious, right? There's an argument there. The guy decides to try to try to diffuse it by sitting down next to the dude and saying, look, he's with me. They, they decide to have an argument. She's getting rude, so he decides to record her because everyone does the record. Could the recording thing, again, even she's a bitch, right? I think the recording thing just sets the wrong tone. It automatically gets someone's back up. Because it's like you're looking for them to fuck up, right? It's like a, it's like a cue. Like you put a phone in someone's, you put a phone in someone's face. It's sort of like, go on, be racist. Come on, say something contentious. Come on, fuck yourself over. Come on, right? It's, it's you're sort of goading them into it. I, I can kind of have sympathy a little bit with a woman just because of that regard. But th what happens afterwards is no excuse. Right before I can have an understanding that she's getting annoyed that this guy is recording her and he's trying to kind of um, go there into response and he's you know he's being a bit he's being a little bit antagonizing without saying much I can get it but what happens after this right what happens after this is inexcusable right and this woman should be um, I don't know man what what you deserve when you do something like this like you deserve the worst thing the worst thing you deserve it right so the the, the video continues so if you're listening via, via the podcast you know, you might have heard so the woman kind of having an argument it, the argument diffuses the, the video cuts and you hear the announcer on the train who's also a young lady you know saying with some sort of glee in her voice that the train will not be moving until these two gentlemen alight or get off the train which two gentlemen being the ones that are on camera or one that's on camera and one we can't see off camera which then makes you think, huh, what the fuck's going on, right? Like, the woman was the aggressor in this thing for the most part. She hit the dude, right? The dude was just recording her because she was being obtuse, right? And then she decided, what, now some, suddenly those two guys have to get off the train. That's not fair, right? Already. So let the video continue and you'll see why it's more than not fair. Train, baby. There's 
Of a drunk, of a drunk person. Wow. A drunk person. So do you hear that? Do you hear that? So the lady who got into an argument with these two guys because they took up a seat, right? So imagine this is the this is the depth of the argument. Say what you want about the him recording, putting a video, right? Again, like I said, video cameras, uh, someone taking out their smartphone and recording you. I think, especially if you've seen the videos that I've seen on the subreddit Public Freakout, right? There's a there's there's a there's a there's a um, there is a type of person that exists out there who is a fucking loser, right? Who has nothing going on in life, who goes around goading people into into kind of freaking out in public, right? So they can post it on, online and show how bad, bad person they are, right? Case in point, that crazy old lady who um, rides her mobility scooter on the pavements and screams and hollers anyone gets anywhere in, you know, even situ of the pavement, you know, sites, flipping uh, traffic laws and that stuff. There's the other, there's that cyclist dude, there's one in England and one in America who has a GoPro on his head and is constantly kind of like tick doing giving people fake tickets when they're you know and incre encroaching on the cycling lane there's those um social justice warriors when they're protesting and they put a camera in someone's face and you know to go them into response so they can hit them as whatever people do this thing a lot right so say what you want about the smartphone right um um kind of antagonizing or making somebody uh react in a certain way what she done after the fact right is heinous right is disgusting and despicable right she has an argument with two guys on a train because they're not letting up a seat right their seat's free and they don't want her to sit down or, and she you know maybe she maybe she's drunk maybe she's not i don't care about that whole fact maybe it does have some relevance maybe it does have relevance but essentially the argument is that they are protecting a seat that you want to sit down and they don't want and you and you want to sit on it so you you know have a back and forth with them and because you lost the argument right because you were made look, to look silly in public because you felt a bit embarrassed or because you, you know, um, you lost face. You then go and accuse them of sexual assault. Sexual assault. Not, oh, go to the conductor or go to a ticket attendant or go to one of the security staff and say, that guy's a fucking dickhead. I was trying to sit down. He won't let me sit down on the, on the seat. Boys these days are rude. Blah, 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 blah. Which is more than fine, right? Call him any name under the sun. He's big head. Who's he think he is with his beard? Who's he, whatever. Say what you want about the dude. Cuss the kid as well. Whatever, right? Like, insult them. But to accuse them of sexual assault in this current climate is, 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 is disgusting. It's disgusting. It really is disgusting, right? Because she knows the power that that statement has, that allegation has. She knows what she's doing. She knows by saying sexual assault, she's effectively letting off a grenade on, on a packed train and closing the doors, right? She knows because no one, no, no one that's what, no one that's not in that carriage, no one that wasn't in, in within that vicinity is ever going to say anything different. Luckily, the guy recorded it. Luckily, it was on the packed train. Luckily, um, he was sitting down. So the likelihood of you sexually assaulting a woman who standing up on a packed train when you're just sitting down and recording the whole situation is very unlikely right because the whole point of sexual assault is that you do it in secret right you do it somewhere where no one's seeing you or you do it in a crowded place or whatever right there's you need to have contact with the person but for the most part this dude's sitting down with his back to the girl right who's standing beside him on the in the kind of um uh in the alleyway or in the kind of you know in the walk path in between the seats so where is he meant to even sexually assault this person but if you're not there you're gonna believe it right so unfortunately the ticket the the, the train operators even though the woman was being snarky on the flipping um uh, announcing uh, thing right she was kind of like she immediately kind of went with oh, i believe all women right kind of tone and even though the dude you know had to go you know one of the conductors i'm assuming or the drivers of the train had to come and uh, say why the train was being stopped even though he had to say what he had to say it's disgusting man it's fucking disgusting and luckily luckily again i'm not a fan of the whole taking out your smartphone during an argument right because again I, I just think it it ramps up beef right i think it's it's equivalent to a guy taking off his shirt before when he's arguing right you're just you want we have, we have to fight now Right? It's unlikely that you see a video of the two dudes um, hooting and hollering or shining at each other and arguing and one takes off his top and they don't fight. They have to fight, right? The moment you take off your top, you're declaring war, right? You're ready to go, right? And you just know what you're saying. You know the strength of, of your words, especially in a, me too, in a currently in a Me Too moment with people you know, saying you should believe all women. This is why you shouldn't believe anyone. Anyone. Man, woman, you shouldn't believe anyone. This is why you shouldn't believe anyone. You shouldn't believe them right if you have a dog you know those videos you see of dogs where they trash a whole apartment and then they're in a the corner like being all shy 
because they know they fucked up, right? They know they made a, a, a really big dude and they're trying to... Or you see other videos where a dog kind of eats something he's not meant to eat and then he kind of acts like he didn't do it and kind of walks off like it wasn't him, right? You don't believe the dog, right? You still chastise the dog for doing a fucked up thing, right? Um, so if you don't believe dogs, you don't believe your own pets, why would you believe a human being who has the worst recollection of events ever known to man, right? Our brains are un uncapable or incapable, right, of piecing together events that happened to us let 24 hours ago, let alone years ago, right? We're, un we're uncapable of doing it in a in a correct way, in a way that is balanced or in a way that accurately describes what happened, which is why we have the court of law. So we can somehow ascertain through various bits of information from my story to your story to witnesses stories. And then we can form some sort of timeline that will give us a probability scoring, right? Because usually most guilty verdicts aren't like guilty, guilty. They're mostly like, okay, more than likely you did this crime. And they then give you a sentence that kind of reflects the likelihood of you doing the crime, right? So if this 100%, you know, you got blood on your hand, blood smooth all over your face, and there's a body in front of your, uh, on, um, at the bottom of your feet, and ascertain that you're the one that bludgeoned the person to death, you know, you're most likely going to get the full punishment. But if they can't place that you are in the, you are in the household, whether or not you had the force or the power in order to kind of, ex um, uh, uh, exert that kind of violence on that person whether or not you knew them how, how can they make sure you're guilty because somebody accused you of it it's impossible to do that and this lady did the same thing but then she knows in this current moment you have to you have to because you know I would do the same thing. You have to side with the woman immediately. You have to kind of be like, okay, dude, I don't believe that this woman might be crazy, but I'm going to have to look into it. You just have to do that, right? And she knows that that already is enough to kind of sow a seed in people's head like, rah, maybe he did it, you know. This guy has got a bit of a history with girls anyway. But I don't know whatever. I don't know this dude. I don't know anything about him. But imagine there's a story out of him out there already that exists that he had a contentious relationship imagine he had a, a violent relationship on both sides because it does that that happens in life right you can have relationships in both sides you can have a violent relationship you can have you, you we all know girls and boys who tend to always go for the person that's the most volatile the most argumentative we know that right we know we've all got friends that do that kind of thing so imagine you're that person who's unlike who kind of you know it's not your own fault but you have a you have a desire to always go out with somebody that is very argumentative that causes you stress but you have the most amazing sex in the world right and then unluckily you get accused of something and they try and link the fact that you tend to go out with crazy women or you tend to go out with crazy dudes and say that could somehow relate to the situation that you're currently in now when the person is making the story up completely it's a figment of their imagination and it's disgusting it's disgusting it's disgusting so I let this video play out a little bit more, but she accuses these two guys of sexual assault. The train stops. They can't move. They're saying they have to get off the train and wait for the police to come. Insane. Of a drunk person. Of a drunk person, man. No, but look how many witnesses. That's what we're trying to ascertain, okay? The people saying that you've been doing anything wrong, okay? So we're trying to find this out, okay? Alright, let's do it. So I can leave my bag there, right? Bring it off. Why would I have to bring it off? I need to get home. This is what I'm trying to say to you, okay? So, disgusting. So they get. So they get taken off the train, right? They get they get taken off the train. So yeah, so they get they get taken off the train. Um, because of this lady accused him of sexual assault, the police have to do their job. Unfortunately, right? It's a, it's just disgusting, man. I'm just it just frustrates me so much, man. Imagine if this guy didn't record it. So they get taken off the train. Luckily, they ascertain that it didn't happen. Uh, the police are fucking legends, and they drive both uh both guys down back down to London, right? In for the you know for the stress cause and whatever. But thankfully, the dude kind of. Uh, continues with his kind of you know um, vengeance to kind of get revenge on this lady for what she done and then he releases an update video that kind of details that unfortunately the woman lost her job um, off the back of everything but you know if ever there was somebody that fucking deserves to lose their job it's this flipping you know mug but yeah so he makes an update video here
I've just been informed that the lady has been fired. Um, I don't wish bad upon people, but after this woman's disgusting attitude and the way she tried to make false allegations, obviously she made false allegations about sexual assault, you know, when there was a full train of witnesses defending our innocence. You know, this woman has to be made an example of. And there's a lot of men sitting in jail right now for something that they never done. So I'm f glad I, and I'm glad that I recorded it. You know, if I never recorded it and it was just me, that woman and her friends and the, the young you on the train, I'll be in jail right now and the young you will be in jail as well. You know, and no one would know the full story. They'll be, they'll be killing us in the newspapers right now. So, which is very, 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 very true. He, if he, if he's as big as a person as it seems that he is, because his story gained a lot of traction online, it went viral very, very quickly, then he would have got absolutely dragged in, in the internet. And again, like I said, if he had any past relationships where a lady accused him of violence or any sort of thing, they would have immediately made the connection and said that, yeah, he's shown a preclusion for it. It's just a fucking awful, awful situation. But again, man, like, I just... I would like to believe that most women are... It's unlikely that most women will make false accusations, right? So there is a bit of value or there is a bit of um, credence to the whole aspect of like believing all women. Maybe you should, right? Because it's unlikely that a woman would go through all that public humiliation, right? Because effectively, when you're admitting to a, a sexual assault, you're not only trying to um, get justice, you're not only trying to make sure that person never does it to anyone again, effectively, you're resigning yourself to becoming a sexual assault victim, right? That's the label you're going to be for forever, right? It's a, especially for the media. I think for the general public, we don't really give a shit, but I think you're going to be portrayed always as the sexual assault victim, right? And even if you're not an activist, you're going to be thrust into the activism activism role you're going to be told to speak for all women when maybe you don't want to speak for all women you just want to tell your own experience so there's a lot of things that come with it that a lot of women are aware of right and i'm sure a lot of them know that you can't come out with frivolous accusations because if you get proved to be wrong then the public should also chastise you in the same way so i'd like to believe that most women aren't going to lie because you have to go through so much shit and no, you only have to watch documentaries on um on rape victims to find out you know the ludicrous laws that are in place or the ludicrous procedures that they do to ascertain whether someone got raped right the the fact that most rape convictions don't actually even happen right there's so many things that go against a woman to uh, accuse someone of sexual assault that nowadays with the me too movement what that's actually done is that even if you can't get a conviction what you do is that you effectively publicly shame the accuser right or the assailant right you publicly shame them so you you effectively resign them to losing their job losing their status whatever it may be right you strip them of, you strip them of the things that they hold dearest because they violated you in some way shape or form so that's kind of like a weird sort of like social justice with that we've kind of like enforced right sometimes it can get a bit crazy with the whole Kavanaugh thing you know like um where we, we can't really make heads or tails of what really happened or whatever. But for the most part, I would like to believe that most women are telling the truth, right? They're not going to go out there and tell stone cold lies. But I would also like just a bit of, a bit of parity, a little bit of um, fairness when it comes to if somebody can lose everything, right, on an accusation, someone should be able to lose everything if, if the accusation is completely false. That's it. I don't really mind... It's weird to say I don't really mind if somebody gets accused of something allegedly, right? Even if it's not been proven, because sometimes it's hard to prove these things. It happened years ago. But if there's if there's a pattern, there's six or seven people coming out saying the same sort of thing. There has to be some... Where there's smoke, there's fire, right? You have... If there's a one-off thing, right? I think it can be a little bit annoying. A one-off thing that you did, um, even... I, I guess if it's not rape, if it's a one-off thing that you were sleazy and you touched on every moment when you were really young or whatever it may be, a one-off thing, right? You should be punished accordingly. But if it's also been ascertained that the person lied, right? Made up the complete story, there should be punishment in the same regard too. But we don't have the same sort. We don't have that kind of recourse. It doesn't really exist in the same way that if someone gets accused of a crime, um, the accusation probably gets more column inches than the retraction, right? When you say to make retractions, who sees it? No one sees it, right? Everyone sees the front page news most more likely, not, which is why most celebrities go after these newspapers in court to gain more public awareness and to kind of drag them their name in the dirt the same way their name got dragged in the dirt. But I don't know, man. I'm just if you're that girl's friend, man, like what do you like? That's disgusting. What she did, man. She tried to end these, and again, I'm not sure. I think the, the 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 thing with the black dude in front of the apartment block in America, I can kind of get more than this because I, I can kind of accept that that woman wasn't racist because she just got into an argument and wouldn't let go, right? Like I said in the other video, I think she was a dog with a bone, right? 
she no, you know when you're go you're coming out your flat, someone's trying to go in but they don't have a key fob, which happened to me sometimes before, and I've got into the kind of back and forth with somebody. Um and then one of you doesn't want to let go. Right? Because you both have a reason. He's trying to get in because he's in the key fob and he knows he shouldn't really be able to get in because he doesn't have a key fob. But then he doesn't wanna um um he doesn't wanna tell he doesn't wanna have to convince a random stranger that he lives somewhere, right? Who the fuck are you? You're not secure. Yeah, I don't have to convince you of jack shit, right? So they get into an argument and no one wants to back down and it escalates to what it escalates to, right? And then you find out that she has a black boyfriend. I don't know, whatever, right? You find out things and you don't really think there's a, there's a racist tinge in there. There might be a racial profiling tinge there, right? Where she's a bit more suspicious of young black men, which is a bit weird, but whatever, right? But this one in a train, right? Accusing two black dudes of sexual assault is, there can only be one, one conclusion there. She wanted to end their lives, right? She felt so, she felt so humiliated right with an argument that wasn't even that big of a deal right she went to sit down and they were kind of mocking her and he sat down instead and to kind of defuse the situation she didn't want to lose face so she decides she to s accuse him of sexual assault it's like whoo insane man insane so yeah so supposedly she's been fired from her job as this guy mentions on the video and yeah i'm assuming her name's gonna get dragged in the mud we're probably gonna see her appear on good morning britain or something i can't wait to hear what piers morgan's opinion on this whole thing is maybe because you know he's always loving to say the most contrarian view but you know maybe he might side of it and go a bit more harder but again i don't know man makes you question the sanity of humanity sometimes but i guess in some respects you know for every hundred people that you get you're gonna get uh, you know you're gonna get one or two fucking idiots who are gonna do things like this but i think for the most part we're generally good people but anyway, I think that's been it. That's that's a good way to good place to probably end it. Episode one one six of the Exeter Zinger Zinger Show. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been an absolute pleasure to be with you guys. I know I've ended it on a bit of a somber note, but hey ho, what can you do? Suck it up, suck it in. I'll see you guys on the other side. I think probably next week. Uh, before that, tomorrow I'm DJing at the Tap East. Uh, so from that called Tap. So if you're in the area and want to hear some good old beats, come on down. Um, next session is going to be the 26th, and then after that I'm DJing on the 9th of November at um, the Heathcote and Staff for another night of Labertees. All information can be found at exnozinga.com click dj gigs and all the listings should be underneath there i've got a blog that's set up there too click that check out my articles things i've written about the tom Sachs overshoot if you're interested in that you can check that out too um and also have any books i'm reading you'll be able to find out all the information on there and contact information whatever you want to see it's all on there as always visit my my patreon link if you want to throw me a couple of dollars in order to make sure this podcast continues function where it is if you want to visit my um audible sponsor link too you can visit that audible.com for us as a double g g y as audible.com for us aggie to claim one free book credit as a 30 day free trial and as always thanks so much for tuning in i'm gonna see you back on the other side this is dippy next to a zigger show episode 116 see you later alligator ah!